John Henry Cole is captain. Boss man, do you ever pray? Well, if I miss this deal, let this hammer get away. Mara be your barren day. Lord, Lord. Let Mara be your barren day. This is on mass, bringing together stories of struggle and hope from the working class. I'm your host, Liz Medina. You are listening to episode two, titled You Got to Keep Up with the Times, featuring the story of Pat McFinn, an Irish immigrant and umbrella repairman. In the previous episode, we heard Sarah's story about her work as a diversion case manager in Barrie, Vermont. She witnessed the effects of deindustrialization in both her hometown of Akron, Ohio, and Barrie, where she currently lives. Crimes born of poverty regularly came across her desk. It should come as no surprise that economic downturns are attended by significant increases in poverty and hardship. It was true during the Great Recession, and it was true during the Great Depression. In this episode, we will travel back in time to the Great Depression, where we will stay for the next four episodes. We enter the Great Depression through the eyes of Pat McFinn, known to the Barry community as Umbrella Pat. While Pat's family left Ireland due to a unique set of circumstances, they chose to come to Barry for the same reason many other families did, which was to make money in Barry's booming granite industry. But Pat didn't follow his father into the quarries. He found his own way. Pat McFinn's oral history was recorded by Mary Tomasi as part of the Federal Writers Project. It was likely recorded between 1936 and 1939, during the Great Depression. Pat's story is performed by Noel Reyes. The old gent put us out to work when we was 13. Me and three brothers. He was one of them hard-working, hard-praying, hard-drinking men. Didn't lay no stock in kids enjoying themselves. Not during the working day hours. Then come night, he'd fetch us in for prayers and bed at nine o'clock. Didn't leave us much time for enjoying ourselves. I came over here from Ireland with the family when I was seven. The old gent used to tell how he happened to make the trip. We lived in one of those small Irish villages you read about, a village that's owned and run by one rich guy. Well, this rich guy had a daughter, an old maid daughter homely as the ace of spades, or so the old gent used to say, and she took a fancy to my father. My father had no special trade. He used to hire out to farmers. Odd jobs, mostly clearing their fields and pastures of stones. He hauled so much stone, he got stooped from it. Did a little blacksmithing, too. Well, the old gent didn't have eyes for the old maid, or so he used to say. Why should he, when he had a wife and four kids? But this old maid, she'd follow him to the fields every day. And when the father heard of it, what did she do but lie and say it was my father that was pestering her all the time? Well, the rich guy was mad, I tell you. He had influence in the village, so the old gent found it hard to find anyone to hire out to. Then one morning, what does the rich guy find in his rose garden but a load of stones, dumped right onto his bushes? He laid it to the old gent, said he'd run him from the village. That same night, he took awful sick from a mess of fish he'd eaten. When he discovered that the old gent had caught them and sold them to his cook, he peddled it around that my father was trying to poison him. Everyone in the village was dependent on him one way or another. He gave them all orders not to give even an hour's work to my father. Father Gilligan came to the rescue. He'd heard my father talking about coming to the States someday. What does he do? 
but borrow from some of his wealthy friends and stake the old gent and family to the trip over here. He told my father as how he'd gone through Barry, Vermont the year before and that it looked as though it was going to be a mighty prosperous town with all the granite they was digging from the hills. Don't remember much about the trip over here, except that we lived for a couple of weeks in a room with about 25 other people. We could hear machines close to the room and chains rattling. At night, we'd wake up to people snoring or moaning or making sick, puking sounds. It was too much for my mother. She lost the baby she was carrying two weeks after we got here. The old gent used to say, God bless Father Gilligan. He's a good man. I'll say a Hail Mary for him every day of my life. I'd gladly say two for him if he had dug deeper into his pocket and given us the extra for better passage. The old gent paid him back every cent. We came straight to Barry. My father found work in the quarries. We lived on a farm in East Barry. The hard work and hard drinking got him in the chest. I was 13 then. He put me out to work for the day for farmers. He didn't want any of us near the sheds or quarries. I guess the trip over here gave me a taste for travel. A runaway from home when I was 15, me and a friend. We went broke in Bristol, Connecticut. We got jobs in a buckle factory. Wasn't that hard work, and it sure felt good not to have to turn over my salary to the old gent. I'd been there about a year when I got brass poisoning in my hand. It swelled and got green and rotten looking. The doctors talked about cutting it off. Rotten looking or not, I wouldn't let them. No, sir, not Pat McFinn. Pat McFinn was going through life with two hands, or he wasn't going through life at all. Well, it's a good thing I didn't let them butchers do their cutting. Look, look it, it's just as good as the other. Later, I wandered down south a bit, got myself in the army for a few months. Didn't like that. Didn't like the food, nor the hours. I kind of like to be my own boss, even in those days. I run away from them. Run right away from the government, and I never heard no more about it. Run away from the United States government and heard nothing of it. There was a colonel's wife at the army post who asked me to mend a silk umbrella of hers. She got me to thinking of my mother and how she'd always wanted a black silk umbrella with a pearl handle, like the rich guy's wife used to own in Ireland. Well, I went back to Barry for a couple of years. I bought my mother the umbrella, but she was dead. She died the day before. I stole in the front room where she was laid out in her coffin, and I'd laid the umbrella alongside of her, under her skirts. I didn't wait for no funeral. I took to wandering the country again, but I couldn't get my mother off my mind. I thought of her and the colonel's wife's umbrella I'd mended, and I got to thinking of what my mother used to say. Everybody's got to have some kind of job, to keep him from going to the devil. Well, right then I got me the idea of mending umbrellas, earning a little money as I traveled along. I wasn't married, never intended to be. I got no use for women. A woman would have been a nuisance on the road. I've mended umbrellas ever since. Umbrella Pat, they call me. Remember that song that come out last year about mending umbrellas? 
The first time I heard it, I felt it was written for me. I heard it in a department store. I was going to buy the record, then I thought, it won't do no good without a Victrola. So I asked the girl at the handkerchief counter if she'd just as soon write out the words for me. She did. They all know Umbrella Pat. I did a whale of a lot of traveling in the old days. Last 20 years, I've struck pretty close to Barry, Montpelier, and Waterbury. Always believed in drinking. I've heard say is how it kills folks. Well, it hasn't killed Pat. I've outlived plenty of my friends. Wasn't never particular about my liquor either. I'm near 80 and I've drunk nearly every liquor under the sun. Sure, I like the good stuff, but once I'm drunk and broke, I'm not fussy. I got me a room in the Pesetti block. Not much of a room. It's warm and comfortable. Old Pesetti died three years back. He was from the old world too, from Italy. Came over here and started a grocery store. Raised a family of eight kids. Educated them all well. There's doctors and teachers in his family now. Old Pesetti lived to build a business block and buy up six or seven houses. The kids are well off now. The oldest girl, Marietta, is about 40. She's got three kids. She still looks after the rumors. She looks after me. And she's good to me. She scolds like hell when I'm drinking. A couple of months ago, she made the rounds of the dime stores and the department stores and told them not to sell me any bay rum or canned heat. Every year she sees that I make my Easter duties. I'm a Catholic, not a good one, but I'm not a bad fellow. Drink a lot, sure, but I don't do no one no harm. Last year I was on a two weeks drunk. I slipped and broke my leg. I happened to be in Montpelier at the time. They took me to the hospital and kept me there two months. After that, I went to the poor farm. I had to. My leg wasn't fit to walk on. I couldn't earn a living. Two of my brothers are dead. The third one might be dead too. Haven't heard from him in 15 years. I was all alone. I had to go to the poor farm. I got out as soon as I could. I don't like charity. I don't want charity. No, sir. I'll pay that poor farm back. No one's going to say Pat took charity. I got me a $500 insurance. That's $250 more than the funeral of Pat McFinn is worth. I'll turn the other 250 over to the poor farm. I don't want charity. I get old age pension now. I don't call that charity. The leg never healed the way it would have if I was young. It's hard for me to get around from house to house. I get along all right with the pension. When the check comes, I give Marietta her rent money right away. And the rest, well, I guess I drink it. It's a pretty good life. I'm not kicking. When I need a little money, I go out and sharpen a few knives and scissors. Folks aren't wanting their umbrellas mended anymore. In the old days, umbrellas was expensive. Folks hung on to them, mended them to make them last. Now you can buy them anywhere for a dollar. It spoiled my business. I haven't bought a suit of clothes for eight years. Women folk take a liking to me. I don't know why. I'm certainly not handsome. Just the same they take a liking to me like they used to, to the old gent. I'll sharpen a couple of knives and a pair of scissors. And the first thing you know, the woman will go digging in the attic for her husband's old clothes. This ulster was given me a month back. I don't call that charity. It's no money out of their pockets. It's just clothing that'd go to waste if I didn't use it. There was a time years ago I'd stop at the sheds, and they'd always have something to sharpen. That's all past, too. Each shed's got her own smithy these days. Well, life's like that, I guess. 
you gotta keep up with the times and with yourself. Pretty soon, my hands will be too shaky for sharpening knives and scissors. I won't go on charity even then. No, sir. Not Pat McFinn. I'll get some pencils and pedal them. I've seen one-armed men and one-legged men selling them. They seem to make a living. That was Noelle Reyes performing Umbrella Pat's story. Noelle is a high school history teacher and, naturally, had a lot to say about Pat's story. From the overall historical perspective, I think about this is a moment in history when it's a lot easier to come to America. I mean, on the one hand, it's never easy because it's going to be time and money and a lot of struggling on a journey. but the rules about coming to America were very different. So it's interesting, like before 1924, before you have a visa or quota system, most of the time, if you can get yourself physically to America in some way, you're going to get into America. And so today, when you think about how much that has changed, and in a way, how arbitrary the rules that we have now about, like, how can you get this documentation to come in or not? So that's one thing that's kind of different, because now it's not just like an idea for an opportunity but there's a lot of regulations that you, that you have to go through. So that's certainly one part of it from a historical perspective. Another historical perspective in this is the idea of the poor farm. So this is somebody who, you know, like poor farm, we don't even use the term poor farm anymore because it's not around. And I think one of the reasons it's not around is because of the onset of Social Security, right? So like from the, from the New Deal, And from when Social Security began is when that kind of got phased out. But I like that it refers to this moment when largely locally, towns really thought about what about people who don't have any help? And I don't know that that system was a great system. But I kind of like the idea that different towns would be sitting with this responsibility and saying, there are people who are in this situation and what are we going to do? I like that kind of thought or the idea of that, like, you know, different people are thinking about how to take care of the people in their community. And I think that's something that is kind of lost now. So like there are people who are kind of out there and then it ends up being no one's responsibility. And whereas like, was there a time in history where it was like the people who are struggling, who happen to live close to us are our responsibility, you know, whereas today it's like, no, you just walk by that same person every day on the way to the subway, but it's not really my problem. On the one hand, I think that this is a story that brings to light how arbitrary someone's social class can be. Or, and what I mean by that is that there's often an idea in America and in a lot of places that if you are rich or if you are poor, it's that way because of something that you did, that you have earned this wealth, or that you have done something wrong and therefore that's why you are homeless. And I think that just history and reality go a long way towards showing us that there are in fact things that are overwhelmingly beyond someone's control or lots and lots of factors that can push somebody to be in the right place at the right time or the wrong place. And so here's an example of somebody because of a confluence of factors finds himself in a position in a new country where he has parents who are not really able to perhaps kind of like support him and lead him in a certain direction. And he, as a result, encounters a number of other challenges, and those just seem to spiral throughout the course of his life. And so it's kind of like a pretty common story. And it would be easy to say, you know, when this person was in a poor farm, especially given his problems and his struggles with alcohol, to say that, oh, this person is in this situation because of that, right? It would be easy to dismiss this somebody as a drunk, and that's why he has nothing. Right. But that's the beauty of the story is that when you get the full picture of the story, like actually his position in life has a lot to do with a misunderstanding that his father dealt with a long, long time ago that had had nothing to do with him. And so like that's like one thing that I think that, you know, we should think about in terms of social class. There are lots of systemic factors that are at play 
in terms of why things happen the way they do. And I guess the other thing that this touches on is this is a story of somebody who is absolutely disgusted with the idea of welfare or charity. And so this person is an immigrant, and he's telling the story later in life. And in a way, just by how the story is told, right, I don't know how many times he repeats, I don't want charity, I don't like charity. And so this is a person who has never let it go. The fact that for this short period of this like 80 plus life, that he was at this poor farm. And so I think that there is, you know, it speaks to this stigma that we have about welfare and having it and like not wanting any of it. And what does it mean to do that? And so I think like that's one thing that we have never really come to terms with. There's always been this like something bad associated with it, you know, and those two things are connected. If we were better able as a society to say, yeah, sometimes there are larger factors that result in people for a short or long period of time needing some help. So what does that look like? If we acknowledge that those exist, well, then there shouldn't be this stigma, right? Because we would be in this, you know, mentality that says this could happen to anybody and anybody could be in this position, right? But it's like, we're, we're very far from that. And so like this person just feels so much guilt about how, oh, I was in this poor form, right? I think there's also like a, a race element to it. So when we think about like who is on welfare today, um, so often there's like a stereotype um, that immigrants are brought into or communities of color are brought into. And I think that's another thing to uncover about welfare, like who is on welfare. Um, and so I think that you would see that people on welfare come from all races, which is not something that you uh, see in a common portrayal of things. So, yeah, certainly, I don't know, in a lot of ways it touches on class. Before we end the episode, I want to tell you more about something you heard in Pat's story and Noel's commentary. That something is poor farms. Before the New Deal, people had very limited options when they found themselves out of work or unable to work. They depended on the benevolence of family members, friends, or local charities. If they were like Pat and didn't have these options, then their last option would be to go to their local poor farm. Poor farms were a form of relief ran by town governments before we had any of the social programs with which we are familiar today. The soaring poverty caused by the Depression overwhelmed towns. The old patchwork of charities offering meager assistance was never enough, and they were completely unprepared to deal with such great need. Greater public efforts were needed to actually help people. The idea of poor farms came from the English poor laws of the 16th and 17th centuries. The poor laws were the first steps towards making society responsible for the poverty it created. Unfortunately, English society and the state didn't feel that much responsibility toward their poor and blame poverty on its victims. The most significant institution to come out of the poor laws were the notorious workhouses. Life was made intentionally harsh at the workhouses to punish poor people for circumstances that were out of their control. Anyone who fell into poverty because of unemployment, age, illness, or disability were often forced to go to the workhouses. Poor farms were essentially the same. Harsh as they were, poor farms were an improvement over earlier means of poor relief. Before the 19th century, poor Vermonters, like other poor people across the country, were auctioned off and sold to wealthier families. According to an article from the Vermont Historical Society, the lowest bidder could quite often be some sordid soul who pinched and starved the unfortunate beings who were thus at his mercy. The establishment of poor laws in Vermont permitted towns to develop resources and offices to manage poverty. During the first three decades of the 19th century, towns decided to buy farms, oftentimes ones that had fallen into disuse, and relocate the town's poor onto them. Once admitted to the poor farm, 
The idea was for able-bodied persons to work in order to make the farm self-sustaining. As Noel commented, there is something uplifting about a community coming together to alleviate poverty. It demonstrated a growing recognition that poverty was not a simple matter of bad individual choices, but something that is more complex and systemic. It demonstrated progress, by small degrees, in how we treat one another, moving from apathy and hate to solicitude and love. On a more fundamental level, it demonstrated a growing understanding that class is arbitrary. That all said, even though poor farms were certainly a step above selling the poor to the rich, they were far from a perfect solution. First and foremost, it was hard to get admitted to a poor farm, even when one really needed it. Towns were encouraged to deny as many applicants as possible, and administrators were generally unsympathetic to poor people. Each town had an overseer of the poor who administered the poor farms. The overseers mainly came from the middle or upper middle classes, making it difficult for them to understand the situation of the poor and working class. They would crudely weigh whether someone was deserving or undeserving of assistance. Furthermore, they would obsessively deliberate whether or not a person was truly a resident of their town. They would shirk any responsibility for their poor in order to miserly mind their budget, oftentimes pawning their poor off onto another town. Some towns would go a step further and threaten to exile families on the brink of poverty so they would be ineligible for their town's poor farm. They were often overcrowded. They often lacked adequate toilets and baths. Outbreaks of diseases, such as tuberculosis, were common. Those who came to the poor farms due to mental illness were caged in filthy cells furnished with only a pallet of straw. Historian William Howard Tucker noted that their pitiable condition was sufficient of itself to make lunatics of all men. It is telling that historical records refer to those sent to the poor farms as inmates. Those who are not literally caged on the suspicion of lunacy were forced to work under threat of various forms of corporal punishment. Whipping was permitted as punishment by the 1797 poor relief legislation. Solitary confinement in what was known as a pest house, which was the name for a smallpox quarantine shed, was also permitted and practiced. Regulations in 1867 permitted the withholding of food with the caveat that such refusal not exceed more than two meals at any one time according to historian Edward P. Kearney. On top of that, poor farms were often located far from town centers, designed to be out of sight of most town residents, according to historian Stephen R. Hofbeck. Desperate as some people may have been, some refused to go to the poor farms because it would mean being separated from their family and community. Historian Andrew E. Newquist wrote that for the aged, the poor, the diseased, the insane, and the crippled, to be sent to the poorhouse was almost like receiving a death sentence. For everyone else, the poorhouse was considered the last word in disgrace. The disgrace and shame the poor were made to feel for their condition, over which they had no control, is the last way in which the poor were made to suffer that I will mention here. I mention it last not because it is the least painful. For some, the shame of experiencing poverty lasts a lifetime. The second half of Pat's story is suffused with a sense of shame. Our performer, Noel Reyes, noticed this too. At the turn of the 20th century, the poor farms began to fade into the past. FDR's New Deal catalyzed the closure of poor farms. During the Depression, there was just so much need the poor farms could never keep up. No town could possibly meet this need on its own. The legacy of the New Deal is still with us. Without it, we wouldn't have Social Security. We wouldn't have unemployment insurance. We wouldn't have the National Labor Relations Act, which has protected workers for generations. We wouldn't have farm subsidies. And we wouldn't have subsidized public housing, to name a few. Lyndon B. Johnson's War on Poverty 
created more welfare programs that have provided necessary relief. Three of the biggest programs that are still with us are Medicaid, Medicare, and food stamps. We now have a patchwork of programs that make the selling of poor people or sending them to the poor farm cruel things of the past. But what would happen to Pat if he were living today and found himself with a broken leg? How would he pay for the medical bill? How would he pay all of his bills while recovering? The United States has the distinction of being the only developed country that doesn't have universal health care. If Pat didn't have health or disability insurance and didn't qualify for Medicaid, then his last option would have been to just beg. More and more Americans are having to resort to begging in order to survive. Some call it crowdfunding. Crowdfunding is essentially modern begging. One of the biggest crowdfunding platforms, GoFundMe, reported that medical expenses rank as their largest single category of appeals. Entirely new crowdfunding platforms have been developed specifically to target those trying to cover their medical expenses, such as you caring. With crowdfunding increasingly covering for the lack of health insurance coverage in the United States, these tech platforms and our social networks are now playing the role of overseer of the poor. Only 10% of GoFundMe campaigns meet their target. Success is determined by what are referred to as medical and media literacies. In other words, how tragic is your story and how well can you sell it? University of Washington professors Berliner and Kenworthy report that the well-off earn more money on you caring than the poor because, in general, they already have the skills and friends required to raise money. As a result, inequalities are exacerbated. With economic disparities comes racial disparities. Berliner and Kenworthy note that African Americans tend to have less wealthy social networks and therefore fewer resources available to draw from in times of crisis. Before the war on poverty, before the New Deal, before the poor farms, there was charity. With business interests and right-wing ideologues tearing up the social safety net, we are going back hundreds of years. Back to Pat's time and before Pat's time. We are going back to the times of beg or die. In the previous episode, Sarah talked about how we hate the poor. And looking at the media and our national policies, it seems to be true. Any of us can lose a job through no fault of our own. Any of us can become sick or disabled. All of us will become old and reach a point where we can no longer work. These are the winds of social and biological forces that are bigger than any individual. The working class is defined by the fact that we have nothing to sell but our ability to work. We can't live off stocks, real estate, or other investments. That means even folks who are earning good wages or salaries, for now, are part of the working class. When we are in crises, we can more clearly see the arbitrary nature of class. Like the weather, our fortunes will change. And when the winds of misfortune bring us clouds and rain, we all need something to keep us warm and dry. Maybe not a fine silk umbrella, but something. How do you think about class? Did you relate to Pat's story? Have you faced financial and medical hardships? If so, what did you do? Let's keep the conversation going. You can post your stories on our Facebook page. Send us a tweet at onmasspodcast or email us at onmasspodcast at gmail.com. That's E-N-M-A-S-S-E podcast. For the next episode, we will hear the story of Donegal, a stone carver. Donegal witnessed his fellow carvers dying at a young age due to the silica in the stone dust, which cut up their lungs like little knives. In addition to the dust, he felt threatened by all of the machines that were taking over in the granite industry, despite the fact that he was a skilled worker and artist. What was a man, a town, a country to do? Thank you for listening. We have additional reading materials, archive footage, and show notes on our website. 
While there, you can give us feedback or suggestions for the next season. This is an independently produced show. I receive support from you, my listeners. If you like this show, go to onmasspodcast.com slash donate to show your support. Special thanks to Noel Reyes for this episode. The song, John Henry, at the beginning of our show is from the Alan Lomax Collection at the American Folklife Center, Library of Congress, used courtesy of the Association for Cultural Equity. I'm Liz Medina. This is On Mass, bringing you stories of struggle and hope from the working class. John Henry told his captain, going on down the track.